You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Muscle Podcast, episode number 448. A dream without the process is a nightmare. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique Story Mapping System will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we are going to learn the art of maximizing film tax credits. Now, I've never personally worked on a film with film tax credits before, so I was very fascinated to talk to our guest today, Zach Tarika. Now, Zach runs a company called Forest Road, and his company has raised over $300 million worth of capital and funded and brokered over 150 film and television projects exclusively using state motion picture tax credits. Now, the world being what it is today, it is tougher and tougher to make a a major motion picture at an independent level, and we can use any little help we can get. And Zachary and I go deep into the weeds about how independent filmmakers can gain access to these tax credits around the country. And by the way, not only the U.S., but there's tax credits around the world. Different countries have tax credits as well. And we're going to go into all the details of what tax credits are, how you can uh, get them, how you need to properly get them and how not to get in trouble because I even tell a story of a few filmmakers that I've worked with in my career that uh, got into a little bit of trouble when they did things that they shouldn't have been doing with tax credits. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Zach Tarika. I'd like to welcome to the show, Zach Tarika, man. How you doing, Zach? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you for being on the show, brother. I, I, I truly appreciate it. We're going to talk today about tax credits, something we have never truly dug into in the podcast, which is a rare thing since we have over 400 plus episodes now. We've covered a lot of stuff in the show and I've never had an episode on tax credits and I've talked, I've talked about them a little bit here and there and I know I'm, I, I know enough about tax credits to be dangerous. Um, so I really wanted to bring an expert on to the show. Um, but before we do that, how did you get involved in this ridiculous business, sir? <laughs> How did I get involved? Well, thanks, thanks for having me, and and I've been a I've been a fan of this, and I, and I'm glad we were able to make it work. Absolutely. Um, I, I was working at a private equity firm, and I was spending a lot of time on tax credits, and I kind of fell into this. It, it's the classic story of a friend asking you to invest in a movie, um, and me wanting to learn more about 
the different parts of it just because I'm a generally curious person. And I started digging into how tax credits were different in film versus renewable energy and real estate. Um, and ultimately found that there was a, a community of people like yourself, I think, uh, that, that are film entrepreneurs um, yes. and, and dangerous in the tax credit game, but not really maximizing the value of the tax credit and how important the tax credit can be in your project. And so like anything else, when you go to buy something or build something, capitalizing it properly is very important. Um, not taking too much debt versus having way too much equity and, and finding that equilibrium and balance. And I found that tax credits uh, allow for the win, 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 right? We as a company, we win because we're helping filmmakers um create their project and we're also making money right I, I don't want this to be about why we're the the robin hood company of, of this industry we we definitely make money mm. uh, and and the second part is this process allows for us to win as a company the filmmaker to win but most importantly these states that have good programs they're winning the with with an election coming up um, and 2020 and, and America in the position it's in in the world, job creation is probably one of the most bipartisan issues out there right now. And tax credits do a remarkable job of creating jobs. And that is the third winner in this, which is these states rely on our company to do things in accordance with their rules and regulations and the filmmakers are relying on us to help them not only do it the right way, right? Get that tax credit back or that rebate back, but they're also relying on us to maximize that value for them. We've had filmmakers come to us and say they have a tax credit worth a hundred dollars. I'm, I'm using a fake number. And mm -hmm. in reality, when we get under the hood and do the work, that tax credit's worth $300. And that means the world for them to not have to go and raise that extra hundreds of thousands of dollars from equity um, or take the bad distribution deal that that I know <laughs> you and I have done so many times. Um, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's bad, there's bad distribution deals? What are you talking about, no, sir? No, never. There's no such thing. Stop that. Say it ain't no so. Such thing, bad distribution <laughs> deal. But, um, but, but yeah, in short, I fell into this um, by accident. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to have fallen into it the, the company that I work at is called Forest Road, um, and it's been a great almost three-year run now at this point, being able to work with uh, both elected um, and, and local officials at the state and federal level, um, but also to work with a lot of different filmmakers watching their projects and their, their business, which is their film, come to life. Oh, I love that last statement, their business and their film, because a lot of filmmakers don't think of their film as a business. They think of it as a creative outlet, which it is. But as I've said many times before, there's twice as many letters in the word business as the word show. And there's a reason. If they, uh, if they don't, if, they, if your listeners don't know that by now, they need to fix their AirPods. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, really quickly, I always like to ask, um, and we talked a little bit about this off air. How did you find me and the work that I'm doing and, and with Indie Film Hustle? I'm always curious. Pride myself on letting our customers know that I'm not in the entertainment industry. I'm, I'm not one that's going to read a script. Um, I'm not going to get into the creative chops of it. That's what, that's what our team is there for. And the same way that I wanted to dive into the film tax credit side of it, I also wanted to dive into the film side of it. Uh, less the tax credits. And so I travel a bunch, uh, obviously pre COVID and, um, and I, I'm always looking for the next good book or, or a podcast. I came across your podcast. Um, and, and actually I don't, it, it's a, it's a funny story. I came across this podcast and every time I went to listen to it, I was on a flight and the flight Every time, three for three, the first three times, I literally hit play, sat in my seat, uh, put my seatbelt on, and uh, the plane would get canceled. The flight would get canceled. 
And I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm done listening to this guy. Like, <laughs> it's, bad, it's bad juju. It's bad karma. I'm done. <laughs> Um, and it and it took a little bit of time and and uh, in the earlier part of this year I was home uh, and and I was on a bike ride and and I listened to uh, some more of the episodes. Fortunately, no, nothing got canceled or, or I didn't tear any muscles during my workout. Uh, and I heard you and then I heard you read uh, off uh, the first chapter of of the book Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. And I quickly sent it around to the team on our end. Uh, and I you know, told everyone that they should order the book and they should listen to this chapter. We were looking at a lot of different things in the space, distribution deals and uh, MG lending and pre-sale lending and what was going to happen with international sales in the midst of the earlier parts of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and it just was very well received by our team. It was very informative. It, it helped answer a lot of questions that I think there are people out there spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, either in losses or in education that they can get for uh, the, the free admission of your podcast. <laughs> and uh, I believe the sub $20 investment of the book. And so I just... I, I love promoting things that I use myself and look into myself um, and use myself. And this was one of those things. And so it was an easy reach out for me. And ultimately what I was doing was I was connecting our clients with you. You know, they would ask us about how should we think about, you know, raising money for this. And I was like, you should actually look at chapter three of <laughs> Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, you know, buy the, buy the, buy the book. Uh, and so that, that's how I came across you. And, and, uh, and, and again, I think in this business today, trying to launch your business, i.e. your film, you have to, um, you know, give, give your book a read. And, and there's so many of these podcasts that will save whoever it is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over the course of, of their career, hopefully their long career in this industry. Well, I will make sure to send you a check for that endorsement, sir. I appreciate <laughs> that very, very, very much. Um, now, really, so let's get into it. What are tax credits? A lot of people don't understand what a tax credit is. Tax credit is in its simplest form. We'll, we'll start really high level and then we can get uh, a bunch more in the weeds. A tax credit in its simplest form is something that you're doing to benefit the state in which you're doing it. So what did I just say? I, I kind of just said nothing. So <laughs> the tax credit is there for you to get something back. You're, you're helping someone do something. So you decide you want to make a movie. So let's just use a real life example. Alex tomorrow wants to make a movie in New York. A vegan chef, a vegan chef movie, sir. A vegan chef romantic yeah. comedy. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And so when Alex looks to make this movie, he's going to raise two types of capital, equity and debt. The debt has a lot of different pieces to it, and we'll put that aside for now. The equity, let's just use the example of friends and family to make this illustrative and simple. On the equity side, he calls 10 friends and they all give him money. Great. Alex is a good friend and everyone was happy to chip in and see this vegan chef, New York romantic comedy come to life. <laughs> On the debt side, there are, I'll just define as a bucket of pre-sales and tax credits. Tax credits are there, help promote things like tourism. This vegan chef romantic comedy movie is going to start off at the Empire State Building. He's going to fall in love at Madison Square Garden. He's going to go on his uh, engagement proposal trip to the Natural History Museum. And then ultimately, this all will culminate with um, him finding out that the love of his life wasn't a vegan the entire time at the Statue of Liberty and the end of the movie, and you'll be left hanging on the edge of your seat uh, to see if um, they end up making it work or not that's, in the that's, sequel. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a and, horrible, horrible story pitch, sir. You obviously are not in the film industry, sir. You are not, you are a finance guy 
through and through, sir. That's a horrible, that horrible first, setup. That was my first pitch. That was my first <laughs> pitch ever. Sir, horrible. Continue. <laughs> so the tax credit is there to promote New York, right? Okay. So Alex is going to bring a lot of jobs when he shows up on day one in pre principal and post. And and we could talk a lot about COVID now because the opportunity and replacement cost of making content is becoming more expensive. It today is more expensive to make a movie because of the coronavirus than it is to or was prior to February 25th, 2020. Mm -hmm. And so the tax credit gets allocated towards your hotel stay, your transportation, your flights, the soundstage grip and lighting, the post-production VFX, the below the line and above the line expenses. Now, every state has its different rules, so I name things that may not qualify for New York. But the important part here is you are spending money to earn a tax credit in the form of New York. It's a rebate. So they actually just cut you a check. So here's a real example. We'll, we'll do a little bit of math, which I know you like to jump into mm -hmm. on these. You've got a film that's being made for a million bucks. You've got 500,000 or half the budget that's going to qualify for the rebate. And the rebate is 30%. So 500,000 times 0 0.3 is 150,000. If you do everything the right way, which no one ever does, and even if you do, the state will not tell you you did it the right way, you will get back $150,000 making your vegan romantic comedy chef movie in New York. Why is that important? That is $150,000 of found money. It's money you don't have to borrow from your dentist or your friends. It's money that you don't have to take from a distributor who may not have the film's best interest in their agenda. Um, it comes from the state and the state is paying out 30% because you just created jobs, tourism and infrastructure. And so the tax credit in its simplest form is a thank you from the state you're shooting for creating those things for that state. Simple as that. It's as simple, it's as simple as that. The, the problem with tax credits is because it is so fairly simple, everyone thinks they're an expert in it, right? It's, it's like any other part of this industry. Um, because everything that I said, I hope would make sense for a fifth grader, everyone now becomes an expert on tax credits. And so you start to miss things. And I'll, and I'll give a great example of missing something. You buy a whole bunch of stuff from Walmart. You go to the store and you buy it and it qualifies for the tax credit. However, Alex, this time you messed up. Instead of going to the store and buying it from the store, you order it on walmart.com and you ship it to the store. You no longer get the tax credit based on what you shipped. So every state and every year has its own intricacies, has its own restrictions, has its own rules, and you're not dealing always with elected officials. You're not always dealing with the right person at the Department of Revenue or Revenue and Taxation or the Film Commission. You're dealing with a lot of people hearing a lot of things with constant launching. So what we do as a firm is make sure that everything is done the right way. Um, and ultimately what that right way means is we're maximizing the value of the tax credit. We're working hand in hand not with what someone at the film commission tells us, not with what your cousin who once made a movie in Pennsylvania two years before you told you what to do. We're doing this so that everything happens such that you maximize the value, you get the most amount back on the tax credit, but also you're doing it the right way with the state. And that happens faster. 
And, and so another big thing that I know you like to discuss on this show is the time value of money, right? What is a dollar worth today versus a dollar worth in two years from now? We had a call today with someone waiting on a New York tax rebate from 2014. What is that money even worth anymore to that person? So we're constantly doing these so that we can push the envelope and get this done as fast as possible because ultimately with debt comes interest and with interest comes losses to your equity. And our goal is to maximize not only the value of the tax credit, but the value of your business, i.e. the film you are making. Now, each state obviously has different rates and some states don't have tax credits uh, or tax incentives as they're, as they're called. I remember when I used to live in Florida, Florida for a while had a good tax incentive, but then a different party came into play and they killed it. And then uh, with that killed all of the, um, all the production that was going down in, in Miami and South Florida. Cause I remember when I was growing up, there was bad boys, bad boys too. Uh, trans, yeah. tra- I think transform. There's a ton of movies that went down there to the point where they just, when they made bad boys three, they shot just the bare essential exteriors and everything else they shot up in Georgia. Why? Yep. Tax incentives, which yep. arguably Georgia now has, is it, it's the best in this, in the country, in the country, one of the best. Georgia is the Hollywood of the South, right? No question about it. Um, The most prolific program highlighted by the investments that have been made by Disney and Netflix and, and, and the bang for your buck you get there is great. No, no question about it. That is not to say that there are not a lot of other states Mm -hmm. that are in line with Georgia or uh, their goal is to you know, overtake Georgia in that program, right? New Mexico has made tremendous investments in their tax credit programs. Uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, Oklahoma, Alabama, Mississippi. What we do as a company is um, in, in going to our website, we actually rank every state that has a program. And if you click on that state and type in your email address, we will send you a one-page cheat sheet on everything you need to know in that state making a movie. So what we want to do is help filmmakers get to the right place for their project. Every project is different. And so just because Georgia is the program to be in right now, that doesn't mean Georgia is the right program for your film. And so maybe if you're based in Los Angeles with everything going on in the world, Georgia doesn't make a lot of sense to be on flights back and forth. Maybe you want to look into Puerto Rico. Uh, Maybe if you're coming from uh, New York, it doesn't make sense to shoot in New Mexico. It it may make sense to go to Alabama. So every one of these programs constantly change. uh, And so it's important to stay on top of that. And that's what we do as a company. Uh, But it's also important to know what your film is and what you're going to be doing as a business such that you're shooting in the right state for your project got it now do you also work with international um like you know because there's incentives in the uk and different countries is that something you guys work with and can you talk a little bit about that it was basically the same concept as it is here in the states the core vision or mission statement of our company is to add value is is to help our client (laughs) if you're if you're if you're calling us because you're really excited about a program in Romania um, and you're exploring shooting there and, and earning those remaining credits, you will hear me quickly say, you should probably work with someone else. We, we can't add value. We can't help. Um, so we work in jurisdictions where we can help. In Canada, in the UK, um, now in, in some parts of Latin America, where we not only know the programs, but we know the people within the programs to move things faster. The underlying programs are are virtually the same, right? They're in place to do a bunch of different things, tourism, infrastructure, and and job creation. We will turn down more projects outside of North America than we will take because ultimately we just can't add as much value. 
All right, fair enough. Now, I, with everything we're talking about with tax credits, I think, and, and the concept's very similar. You spend $100,000 there, you're going to get 30% back, so you're going to get $30,000 back. And that's a very generalized way of looking at it. Is there a way to leverage tax credits to help get financing, saying like, okay, guys, we have a million, this is a million dollar. Um, this is a million dollars, but we really only need 700,000 because we qualify for a million dollars because we're going to do everything in Georgia where it's a Georgia production, everything. We're not going to breathe outside of Georgia. So that means we are, we know that $300,000 is coming in. So when raising the remaining 700,000, can you leverage that 300,000 to help you get the financing? That's the biggest that's that's the biggest thing, right? So what we want to do is make the cost of capital of the film as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So in that example that you just gave, a million dollars where you only need to raise 700,000 because 300 can come from the tax credit, that's a home run win-win-win scenario for all, right? Mm -hmm. And so what were you going to do if you didn't raise that extra 300,000. What were you going to do if you had 700 making a million dollar film with that 300,000 coming in from the tax credit? It would have come at the expense of higher interest debt. It would have come at the expense of a bad, potentially MG deal. It would have come at the expense of, you know, less shooting days. It would have. So the beauty in what we're doing is we're actually a capital provider. So we're coming to you saying, look, you thought your tax credit was worth 300,000. We actually think it could be worth 400,000. And we're giving you that, we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is 100% of the time. So I believe in the ability to show, you know, the buy-in by action, not words. There, you know, any one of there, I could point you to a long list of people that will tell you what your tax credit's worth. I cannot point you to a long list of people that will actually put the money up for what they tell you it's worth. <laughs> right. And so, so when you get a number from us, that's a number, not that we're going to go take to the bank, not that we're going to go do anything else with that. We as a company that we're going to put the money in, we're investing that. So if you're looking for capital against the tax credit, um, we are the one-stop shop for not only maximizing the value, getting it back faster, brokering the tax credit, which is something we haven't hit on yet, but also lending, putting capital in your pocket immediately. Now, how can, how can the tax credit, if the state gives 30%, how can that tax credit be worth more than 30%? Well, it's worth 30% on what qualifies. Mm -hmm. So you've got the numerator and the denominator. And the most important part is getting the qualified number, right? Because no matter what, you're going to multiply by 0.3. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you multiply by a million or 500,000, mm -hmm. that's the differentiator. Oftentimes, the difference between 500 grand and a million is the fact that the filmmaker didn't know how to qualify and code the expenses in the QRE, the qualified report. So it could have been, you could be adding, there's other things you're like, it's basically like going into a, having a forensic accountant or just an accountant go in and go, yeah, you you, you could have saved another $10,000 in taxes this year because you didn't uh, expense this properly or expense that Absolutely. properly. Absolutely. So that's, uh, that's, that's fairly valuable. Uh, <laughs> now, <It's> what... <laughs> From our standpoint, what we're trying to accomplish, because the more we can maximize that value for you, mm -hmm. the better your film's going to be. I mean, it's it's so simple, and and I hate oversimplifying things, but less stress and pressure will generally always equal a better product. No, in any, stop in any it! Industry. Stop it! So so it's just one of those things where. If we can alleviate and we can give you the comfort of a couple extra days of shooting, um, a couple extra days in a timeline for delivery, uh, a bigger or, star, 
a bigger star, uh, a better trailer, better music. Uh, that's that's what we bring to the table. Now, what? Uh, okay, so this sounds great, and we've been throwing around a million dollars as as a kind of number. But what is the minimum requirements to take advantage of tax credits? Because I know every state's different. Some states won't even look at you for less than a million, and some will look at you for half a million. What what is the kind of the the, the kind of range? Because I'm I'm imagining a fifty thousand uh, dollar indie film is not qualifying for tax credits as a, as a general statement. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So what's interesting is that the states, and and we've been very active in promoting this, the states that we work in, and and I'll, 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 I'll go through a couple now, they've done a great job of putting programs in place for the sub $200,000 film. Um, and so what we've discovered, and, and actually as part of a study that was done uh, in conjunction with the uh, um, University of, of Utah, uh, was we found that whether you're a $200,000 movie or a $2 million movie, there's still the same amount of effort and job creation and line producers and accountants and sure. lawyers. And, and so we felt like there was this unfair bias to, well, it's got to meet this criteria of $2 million. Why? Actually, we've seen that on a $2 million movie, they actually had less people than the $200,000 movie. And so Louisiana has done an incredible job uh, of, of building out their program for these smaller films. New York has done a great job you know, promoting areas outside of Manhattan. Uh, Long Island, upstate, or programs that are sub um, a million dollars. And I think the more that these programs can grow in Ohio, in Massachusetts, um, Kentucky had this type of program, but recently shut it down in in 2018 and 19. Um, I I think they will, I think people will realize that, that they belong at these states at, at a lower budget range. Now, in your on your site, you talk a lot. Uh, you talk a little bit about buying and selling tax credits. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, we talked about New York, where you actually get a check in the mail, mm-hmm. a rebate check, right? You, Alex, made that movie, five hundred thousand qualified. He finds out at the end that she wasn't a vegan. And, and the, the movie it's ends. a horrible, reading, horrible romantic, romantic, yeah. romantic comedy, horrible random comedy. <laughs> yep. yep, exactly. And and you get your check in the mail for one hundred fifty thousand. Everyone's a sure. winner. And you're all happy. Well, what sure. happens when you don't get a check in the mail? What happens when you have a credit that you need to monetize? So what happens there is you need to find someone with income in that state because they're going to utilize the tax credit to offset their tax expense. And so let's just use Georgia because we talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Um, Disney makes a lot of movies in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Disney has no income in Georgia. Therefore, they do not pay any Georgia state income tax. However, a lot of other companies do make income in Georgia, Coca-Cola, Delta, Cox Communications, uh, Georgia Pacific, um, Chick-fil-A. Those companies do want to use those tax credits. So Disney earns them, right? They generate them because they make a movie in Georgia. And Delta, bad example in the environment because they won't have much taxable income (laughs) for the foreseeable future. But a company like Delta, let's use Home Depot, mm-hmm. where everyone is improving their home right now because they've been trapped and for, for six months, yeah. uh, eight months. And, and um, they will buy the tax credit from Disney at a price where there's a spread in the middle. So Disney earns a tax credit 
and then they sell it to the addressable market, i.e. the income earner. And what we do as a company is we connect buyers and sellers. So if I have a, so, okay. So if I have a hundred dollars in tax credit, mm-hmm. I'm Disney yep. and I'm going to sell it to, to home Depot. I'm assuming I'm not selling it at a hundred dollars. I'm a selling it at a discount. Correct. And now does Disney, so the, is there no other way Disney can use that money? That credit? There's no, there's no other way they can use it. Okay. So they have to go down this road. They have to sell it. And so the market for Georgia tax credits right now is 88 to 91 cents. Okay. So it's got to trade at a steep enough discount for the buyer, Home Depot, to want to earn a return. So mm-hmm. if you buy something, let's just use round numbers. If you buy something at 90, mm-hmm. you just save 10% on your taxes. Right. And you want to buy as many of those as they're available. Well, in theory, you want to buy as much of it of the taxable income you have right? so that you can pay as little in-state in- income tax. So for the cost of 10%, they get to write off 90% of taxable income. Well, said a little bit differently, yes. you get to buy something at 90. Mm-hmm. You get to buy a million dollars of taxable liability mm-hmm. for 900000 So you've solidified, you've crystallized crystallized a profit of a hundred thousand dollars got it taking no risk well that seems is there a place for for personal income like that sir can can we <laughs> can we do that sir is there is there a place that we the the, the poor independent filmmaker trying to scratch out a living here in los angeles because god knows la doesn't have any taxes um <laughs> we could purchase well, some california california is is i i don't, I don't want to go on the record for for speaking poorly of california but California is a good example of uh, a state that doesn't have great tax credit programs no. for the film industry, um, unfortunately. No, and, and, and the, the, it's been like that forever. From and, and, I, and I know whatever tax credits there are, they get gobbled up by the studios. That's right. It is very hard for the independent film community, despite our lobbying efforts and, and what we have tried to accomplish working with the Film Commission and others – to have tax credits allotted to uh, the small indie filmmaking community, um, it's just it, we just haven't had great traction and success in doing that. But there's plenty of places in the country that you can can do that nowadays, and and you know things might change. Like you know, I, right now there is an exodus out of California. Um, yeah, uh, there's an exodus leaving California because taxes are ridiculous, and now. I just, and I, just as a general statement, this is a little off the rec, off the topic, but the whole, our whole industry has changed so dramatically now because the work from home model is now established and employers like it, employees like it. It's less cost for the employer. It's more convenient and more productive for the employee. Um, that's changing so dramatically. And then all of a sudden people living in large cities, Especially in our in our in, and maybe different for crew people, but people who live work behind the scenes or other things like that, they just they just like why am I spending obscene amounts of money living in L.A., New York, Chicago, when I could just move to Georgia, <laughs> where I could I could buy a mansion for the price of a shack here in Los yeah. Angeles. I know. I I do believe that um, there are a few cities. In, in in the United States right now that are going to have a tough time digging out of this hole that is created for them. And, and those cities, as, as you look at them on a map and you look at the percentage of the city that is taken up by the three R's, uh, retail, uh, residential real estate, and uh, restaurants. And, and any of those cities are not going to be able to bounce back in the way that other cities can. And, and on top of that, um, the tax rates in California and New York are going to go higher. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. And, and to me, it speaks volumes to why tax credits will become a more prevalent part of society and our in- and community. 
But most importantly, I, I think it will just be tied to where people end up going to. I think you will see a, a flight out of Manhattan. I think you will see a flight out of Los Angeles. Um, I, I just, I don't see how it's how it doesn't happen that way. Now, Zach, can we talk a little bit about tax credit fraud? Uh, cause I have some personal experience with that and, uh, I would love to hear some of your stories and then I'll be more than happy to tell mine. The tax credit, um, wow. Tax credit fraud. So let's start with, there is a ton of it, um, <laughs> out there. Uh, and, and I think maybe even taking a bigger step back, we talked prior in, in one of our earlier conversations, just the barrier to entry in the film industry. And I think what is unique is, you know, you, you want to be a dentist and you go to dental school, you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school, you know, if you want to be a filmmaker, you you just show up and, and you change your LinkedIn profile or your Facebook pitch. And so you will always deal with bad apples and, and this industry, like all others have the bad apples in them. And so fraud, especially, in tax credits is I think the most notable or or relevant thing to talk about when you do talk about tax credits. I think most of the time the filmmaker genuinely doesn't even realize they're committing fraud. Um, And I think the examples that I would cite on, on this is examples where they did know that they were committing fraud because look, at the end of the day, when you're working hand in hand with a state commissioner, a film office, an accountant, a lawyer, you're going to make mistakes. And, and hopefully using Farsort as a company, we can help avoid those mistakes. But the reality of the situation is they're going to happen. I, I think they become big issues when there's fraud. So what is tax credit fraud? It's actually pretty simple. The most notable form of tax credit fraud is related party transactions. So Alex moves to New York a month before he makes his movie about the vegan chef romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And Alex buys three vans. Uh, We'll just make this super simple. Three white vans. And Alex charges every time an actor lands at JFK airport, Alex jumps in his van, he throws on his little driver hat and his suit, and he picks up George Clooney from JFK. Right. It comes time to hit all the expenses. Um, and Alex submits the expenses for the tax credit And he says that every time he picked up George Clooney or whoever was in the movie playing Alex in this romantic comedy. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Yes. Um, And and, and he charges $100,000 to pick up George Clooney from the airport. Now, now why would Alex do that? Well, Alex is the sole member of Alex Transportation Company, the white van that picked up George Clooney from JFK. And so – you're saying to yourself, well, that's not fraud. I paid myself $100,000 from the money that I raised from investors. They didn't ask who or what I was doing with the money other than to say I was making a movie and I qualified that for the tax credit. Well, the problem is, is that the state is going to pay you a rebate amount off of the total amount that you spent. And in reality, it should not have cost you $100,000 to pick up George Clooney from the airport maybe it should have cost you $300. So that is the most relevant form of a related party transaction that is fraud. And so what happens is, is back to the numerator denominator, you are taking 0.3, 30% of the tax rebate, and you're multiplying it by the qualified expense of the film. And so if you only spent $300 at a 30% rebate versus $100,000 at a 30% rebate, 
Well, you just sold, you just stole about $29,000 from the state of New York. And so that is fraud. And that it's also a federal situation, if I'm not mistaken. Can be. Well, well, it can be. Um, where we've had great experience is at the state level where not only was it a related party transaction, but there are things like changing general ledgers and cost reports. Um, you mean having two sets of like two sets of books like like the mob? Two exactly. <laughs> there's there's two sets of books. There is you know, we we've seen a bunch of different things. I, I would say the most common is not two sets of books, but we've actually seen just outright made up numbers in a cost report. And so the way accounting works, really high level, <laughs> payroll providers, production accountants are creating statements, both cost reports and general letters. And so if you are submitting material to an auditor, generally a third party auditor, and that auditor is using fake numbers tied to uh, a, a misrepresented cost report, which then created a fake general ledger, which then created a fabricated audit, that is fraud. And, and it goes all the way up, you know, potentially to, to the federal level, because what happens is, is the, the auditor is being hired by the state to do the state's work. And so when the auditor doesn't catch the fraud, it becomes the state's problem. And when it becomes the state's problem, it becomes a big problem. So I've actually heard of companies and tell me if this is actually legal or not. I've heard of this in the years of me walking around in this business where they're like, okay, we're going to go shoot this movie in Louisiana Mm because Louisiana has a really great tax incentive. We're going to set up a post house in Louisiana and we're going to open up a company that's going to do all the posts there. We're going to fly people in and it's going to be a Louisiana post company so we can qualify all that expense to the tax, uh, the tax credit. Um, and we're going to keep that company going for a few years doing other projects and stuff like that because we're going to keep coming back. Is that legal? That is not only legal. That's a that's a great thing, right? Okay. Because that's creating jobs and that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Here's where it becomes not awesome. <laughs> that same example you gave, we're going to go to Louisiana, we're going to open up a post-production company and we're going to create jobs and – it becomes not cool or not legal when you don't disclose to the state that it's your business, right? So if you open that post house right. and your film is also using it, what the states do, which I think is smart on behalf of the states, is they cap the amount of tax credits that can come from related transactions. So using your example of Louisiana, It's great that they built a post house, that they're creating jobs. However, what if the VFX normally would cost $100 and they're charging $100,000? Sure, same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. The same thing. As long as you can show, look, this is market. This is – we're doing things the right way. Then there's a cap on how much that can be. So another good example is in Illinois, right? They have a post credit. So what you have is you have principal photography that goes in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then you've got post production that goes in downtown Chicago. But now they're trying to qualify the entire expense of this post job. But we all know that some of it was done in Los Angeles and we all, you know, especially in a world today where you can do a lot of this stuff from a lot of different places. So the states constantly need to be changing and amending and working with production companies and working with lenders to make these programs more efficient and better. Because I've heard, I mean, I've I've been a party too. I've not say I was involved in, but I've heard of something setting setting up a company like that in Louisiana, and then all of a sudden, using, let's say, an LA or New York 
VFX guy and paying them the you know to do the majority of the work but funneling it through that post house that's now in and that's that's fraud that is fraud straight up that is straight up yeah and so generally and and it's it's tough to stereotype but when we hear words like in kind or funneling um, or, or defer or related party, our ears perk, perk up, up a little bit um, <laughs> because we're trying to we're, we're not we're not trying to ruin anyone's day, but we're trying to steer people clear of of the danger that they can get themselves into, and and oftentimes are led into um, by some people in this industry that that are not having their best interests. So I, I promise. I- I, I promise I would tell you my uh, my my tax credit fraud uh, stories, which are um, terrifying, because I was sitting yeah. around um, selling olive oil because I used to sell olive oil uh, when I got out of the business for three years, and that's a whole other conversation nice. for another day. I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I get a call uh, on my phone, and like, "Hi, is this Alex Ferrari?" I go, "Yes." They're like, "This is the FBI," and I'm like, "No, seriously, who is this?" And like, "No, sir, this is the FBI." I'm like. <laughs> I'm sorry. What would you? What can I do for you? They're like, did you work on X movie? I'm like, y- y- yeah, yes, I did. He goes, do you know this person, this person, and this person? I go, well, yeah, they were the producers of the film. We're flying in to talk to you. The term "we're flying in to talk to you" from the FBI is not scary. something you want. It's scary because they can't. What do you mean? Like, it, this is like we have to do this in person. We can't do this over the phone. So that that I was like, oh my god! Like, where can we meet you? I'm like, just meet me at my olive oil shop, I guess. So uh, we went over. Oh my god! They fly in and they tell me I'm like this guy did this, this, and this, and we're just trying to figure out where the money trail is. How do they pay you this and that? I'm like, well, what's going on? They're like, well, we really can't say, but these guys have been indicted. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say yeah. anything. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not gonna say anything. They've been indicted, and we're building a case up against them. They're currently under arrest, and they, and we're doing this, this, and this. And I was like, oh my god! And they, it was fascinating to see what happened. They went to jail. These guys went to jail um, for tax evasion. And I won't say what the state that they were in, uh, but it's it, 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 when I when I told you the story, you're like, oh, it's this state. I'm like, yeah, it's that state. Um, but <laughs> we won't say the state. Yep. But um, that was one. And then another one I was doing post on another job, which was a three or four million dollar movie. And it had a big star that everyone would recognize their name if we heard it. And the director, who was also the producer, stated that they that in the in their cost reports, which I don't even know how you can add that as a tax credit because it's 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 a salary. I guess it was a rules of, of, of that state. Because yeah. it's the salary of an actor who lives in Los Angeles, so I didn't know how that worked, but whatever. He said he paid him one point five million, and in reality, uh, when the actor was asked, the actor said, "No, no, I was paid three hundred thousand." And the guy went to jail yeah. for like a year and a half in a federal penitentiary for yeah. tax fraud. And I was just like, "Oh my!" I'm like, "This guy was sitting in my post suite. We were talking and jamming. It was like, this is serious. It's serious, That's guys." What happens. And 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 these you know producers they hear, "Oh well, you can give you know actor X Y Z a million dollars and then have him reinvest seven hundred thousand in the movie, and so instead of the three hundred thousand that would have qualified for the tax credit, the million is." "Quote unquote qualifying," and that's fraud. I mean, that's illegal, and and it's important for all of us to know the rules and to understand the consequences. That you know, when you when you mess this up, you're not dealing with you know the dentist that lent you a hundred grand. You're you're dealing with the state of New York, California, <laughs> right. Georgia. Um, you know, it's it's the state of New York versus <laughs> X. Right. And and that's a scary that's a scary letter to get um or phone call to get for sure. Now is this um so you obviously would recommend if you're going to go down the tax credit road to really partner with someone who's done it a ser- a serious company uh and or producer who has uh, vetted experience. And you can you can do the homework and check what they've done and see if they're real and do your homework, because if you try to do this on your own, you'll never, you, you just can't. I think I think you look. 
I, I don't want to um, belittle anyone, right? You, you could if you wanted to. The question is, is you have a lot of, when, when you're building this business, your film, there are only so many hours in the day and having been a part of a lot of these, I get that you're working 24 hours, seven days a week until this thing is born. And the question you have to ask yourself is, is it a good use of my time to be reading the statute <laughs> in New York, to, to be filling out the endless amount of applications and going through the final application process and the audit process? And, and so what I would say to any of the listeners, when you're contemplating taking money from anyone, but, but especially in something where you are not going to do the work yourself. I can say whatever I want to the person. Require them to walk through with you the deals that they have done and give them the ability to put you in touch with their borrowers. The selling point that I give for Forest Road is I'm not going to pitch you on what we do. But I'm going to give you a list of the 150 projects we've done in the last however many months. Call them. Ask, here's their email address. Ask them about it. Because whatever I say to you, you're not really going to underwrite to anyway. Because I've got an agenda and I'm running a business and I want to make money. So call them and ask them. We turn down projects because projects don't make sense for the borrower, for, for you, the, the end user. Make sure you're working with someone that's going to do the same. Make sure that if you're doing a deal that it makes sense for them because it has to and no one's expecting charity, but that you understand what you're getting yourself into and how it works. Uh, that, that to me, it's just not a good use of a filmmaker's time to be the one doing all this tax stuff. In, in air quotes. Um, that's, that's what I would go with on this. Well, I mean, if it's the equivalent of like, I'm generating a million dollars in income and using TurboTax as opposed to get, or using an accountant. Could I do it? Yes. Now, if you're making, if you're making $50,000 a year and you don't have a lot of, it's not very complicated, TurboTax is perfectly acceptable. But right. if you're making a million dollars or you have a million dollar film and Doing it yourself is the equivalent of doing TurboTax, and you really should get an accountant or someone who knows what they're doing to help you save money, because they're going to see things that you won't see. Um, and whoever that, whoever that, if it's your company, if it's another company, another, another individual um, that knows what they're doing, you should really reach out to these people. Um, and I it, obviously, your company is a uh, front and center here. <laughs> Hey, look, I, I, I would go back to um, every dollar invested in a film is a risk dollar. It's oh. a risk. <laughs> and so, and so the, the, at, on its face, there is riskier parts of the capital stack, i.e. the equity. And then there are safer parts of the capital stack, the, the MG from Netflix, right? And so no matter how you cut it, there is risk involved. What I'm suggesting is if you partner with the right person on the tax credit, you can mitigate that risk entirely and focus on other parts that are of more risk. So if you don't partner with the right person on the tax credit and it takes you five years to get your money back, what will likely happen is you will end up losing money on other parts, like the equity will get hurt because of the interest expense of the tax credit loan. And so pick your spots as the CEO of your film on where you want to allocate the resources. I said maybe a little bit differently, what makes a great CEO is their ability to invest capital and then in human capital. So you as a filmmaker, you as the producer of this title, you need to pick where you want to spend your energy, both on the investment of dollars, but also on the investment of people. And the product offering that Forest Road gives 
is the ability to bet on us that we can not only maximize the value of the tax credit, but get it back faster to you than anyone else in the market can. Now, that's the, that's the question. Why does it, why would it take so long? What, I mean, I mean, you're working with government, so obviously government's very speedy and efficient. Uh, and it, it's, it's super sufficient and nothing ever goes wrong. So I don't know why it would take long, but I understand it might be, you know, a year, two years, but four or five years down, like what causes that? And what do you do to speed that process up? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So the number one thing that causes delays, I'll use the college admissions example. If you were to apply to college today, and and I don't actually know what it would entail, and I feel like in this COVID world, who knows what is required and with with standardized tests, et cetera. But let's use the the pre-COVID model for applying to college. You have your high school grades. You have your extracurricular activities. You have your standardized tests. You have the big three. Then you have the, the sub-tier things, your essay and the questions. Why, why do you want to go to the University of Michigan? And you have those as, as sort of the sub-tier things. Now, if you submit everything all at once in one beautiful binder um, and present it to the university, the likelihood that you will get in if you have the goods, if you have the grades, you got the essay nailed, and you did well on your tests, you're going to get in. If you apply with your decent grades, but you left out the essay, or your essay, but you left out the standardized tests, guess what's going to happen? The University of Michigan isn't going to call you to remind you to send in the essay. They're going to sit on your application and you will never hear from them. And then you will wonder why you didn't get in. Well, the difference is, is that with college, you have a time period in which you know you need to apply and then accept and then enroll and then attend. With tax credits, you'll sit outstanding in perpetuity forever. Because you still haven't sent in your EIN number or you still haven't submitted your operating agreement or you still haven't finalized the payment to the auditor. And and the state isn't there to remind you to do it. The state's not signing up to give you money. So if you don't do it right, I promise you, you'll never get it. And so the difference between four years and four months is making sure you did it right and making sure you have someone to hold your hand and take you through that process right? so that everything gets delivered timely um, in a way in which the state can respond to it timely. It's similar – it's similar in posts where if you've never delivered a movie before to a distributor or to a streaming service and you do it all yourself because you saw some YouTube videos, um, that's one way. And then it, you're going to be going back and forth with QC issues and audio pops and technical things because you haven't gone through it. Or you hire a post supervisor or an online editor who's done it 50,000 times. You pay them a little money and they make sure everything gets done right. Yep. It's 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 just penny wise pound foolish basically. Exactly right. Now, um, with COVID, man, how is COVID changing the business right now for you guys? Because obviously, production is yeah. uh, unless you're Tyler Perry on the Tyler Perry lot. Um, it's yeah. it's it's a little rough right now in the in the U.S. Production companies are treadmills, right? They work as long as they're turned on and they're keep and they keep going. And so, COVID has halted that. And we've stopped. Um, Now, we actually do have four productions that are in principal photography right now, uh, which is crazy. Uh, I I do not like risk that much. But if you're making a movie today, you are taking big risks. Huge. Um, On top of which, we as a firm don't require a bond. So we've been busier than ever Mm -hmm. um and and, and that's great but it's risky right and so for us 
we are looking at a couple different projects. They're going in Georgia, they're going in New Jersey, they're going in Puerto Rico. Um, and we're pumped to be a part of them and excited about being a part of them. But it is scary for sure. And, and with the union guidelines and the state guidelines uh, and the, the risks of running false positives um, and the Shutting risks down of production, right. uh, actors that are in an age gap or, or constraint where there's real risk to their health and, and well-being, um, it's scary for sure. And I, and I don't see it changing for a long time. I, I think, I think uh, obviously we're not on this podcast to talk about a vaccine, but I don't see any part of the union guidelines or state guidelines changing until uh, a vaccine is acceptable um, to the masses. And, and, and tested for six months yeah. to a year to see what really yeah. happens. Yeah. I've been I've been saying that forever, and people are like, "Oh, don't be so negative." I'm like, "I'm not being negative. I'm I'm I'm, I'm preparing for the worst and hoping for the best, man." But yeah. I I think we're at least 2022 before things start to even remotely really start to come back up. But to come back to pre night pre 2020, it's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be years. Well, it's it's a good example would be like buildings, right? So I'll. I'll I'll, I'll make up an example. I don't even know if this is true, but you have buildings that are all made of wood. And then one day someone says all new buildings that are this high need to be made with steel. And so this transition from wood to steel occurs. Well, if steel is more expensive than wood, which it normally would be in that pe- period of transition, mm-hmm. the price to make content uh, I'm using as a building, i.e. building. And so right now, pre-production is a lot more expensive than pre-production pre-COVID. Principal photography is a lot more expensive than it was pre-COVID. So the cost of making content is going higher at the same time that demand for content is going higher. And I think that that is a great opportunity for your listeners and for the producers out there that want to make titles, want to make content. We just need to create a way to do it safe and we need to work with state uh both local and and federal governments to do it the right way uh and we need to make sure that not only are we doing it the right way but we're also doing it the right way for the investors too right like the 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 making the 10 million dollar movie that only has the resale value of a million dollar hallmark end product is not a good idea you may have made it safely but it's not going to end well for your investors and therefore it's not going to end well for you. And so that's the second, you know, negative here. And, and I, I, when you, um, when you sent your book, my book around to everybody in the company, you also do real estate and, and energy credits yep. as well. Um, can you please tell everybody, <laughs> can you please tell everybody what the other two departments said to the filmmaking department? <laughs> So, so the quote that I got in an email is, why does anyone waste their time working in this industry, dot, 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 woof. <laughs> and that was probably just reading the first chapter. <laughs> and that, that, was, yeah, that, was probably, that was probably reading just the, 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 the title page or, or the, the back of the book with, with the quotes, right? So, so um, yeah, I, look – Every industry has its headaches. And we as a company, we like to focus on correlating our headaches with our returns. So if we make 80% of our money in the real estate industry, but film is 50% of our headaches, that's uh, that's a bad business line item for us. So we like to make our headaches align with our profitability. Um, but that, that being said, uh, I know some of the other members of our team on the real estate and renewable side that, that did very much at least enjoy some of the chapters in this book <laughs> as it pertains to some of the horror stories that, uh, that, that you both, uh, and, and your reader have lived through. Um, yeah. And, and that's the thing I, I, I want people listening to understand when, when you're talking to investors, it's a very specific kind of investor who invests in, in, in motion pictures. 
because unlike real estate, at the end of the day, you have real estate. Like you have a tangible product that you own, whether the market goes down or up, you have land, you have a building in one way, shape or form. When you make a movie, even if you've got a sucky building, like it's badly designed, it's still a building. It has some sort of value to it, inherent value to it. Whereas in a movie, if the director was bad or ego driven or the movie's horrible and it's not marketable, there's essentially no value there. And you've basically burned a million dollars. You hopefully have enough people on your team that can kind of mitigate that risk by story, by talent, by genre, by other things like that to actually make it a viable product. But I want people to understand it's like, it's a specific kind of individual who wants to invest in movies. And I'm sure you deal with these, these guys all the time because it's, and there's end games, different end games. Some guys just want like, Hey, this is fun. I'll throw it. I'll throw in a half a million dollars. Um, I just want to be part of a movie. that will be kind of cool. Can I go to a red carpet or, you know, meet some cast and be on a set? I think it's cool. And other people are in it for the money, which still to me is, it's like, if you have a million dollars, would you invest it in a film or would you invest it in real estate or would you invest it in any other million kinds of investments? Um, it's it's really interesting. And you coming from – what I find fascinating is you come from a financing background. You do not come from a creative artistic background, obviously, with that pitch. Um, that's very – obviously, that's uh, very evident. Um, <laughs> but um, – uh, no offense, sir, but uh, no. But um, – the um, but if you're coming from finance and yet you decided to open up a, a shingle underneath this this company for film financing, yep. the reason why was because again this is crazy. It's just a crazy business where it's it's insane, ridiculous, upside down business. I understand why I'm in it because I was infected with the the, the film bug. 25 years ago once you once you get it you don't get get rid of it um and there's a passion behind it because i'm an artist as well as a businessman but you're a straight up business guy um why did you do this <laughs> yeah i geez i'm uh if, if you ask me on the wrong day i'll say i'll tell you that uh that i still don't know why i did it i i think um so i got into it in a way that was just bizarre right it, a, a friend had asked um if i would look at his investing in his in his film um Wait, and, by the way did you invest in that movie i did not know okay good so you're okay good that. that that says a um, lot about you i just wanted to know because i want to know who i'm talking to <laughs> yeah i did not um and again just going through the motion of of i i ultimately ended up doing a tax credit deal with with uh, on this first one, mm -hmm. um, but what ended up happening was just this ultimate curiosity with how this could work and creating this situation where the state could win, our company could win, the filmmakers could win, and us to earn an adequate or or a good risk adjusted return. So, I think. You know, in looking sort of like why we're in this industry now, it, it's worth noting, right? We do not ask for a credit in the film. We do not want to read your script. We do not want to be executive producers. We do not want to go to your premiere. We we are like the <laughs> least sexy. Um, That's amazing. You know, film investors you will ever meet, uh, and and so we really just like the notion that we can add value to the title and the business and also the state and make a good return on our investment. Well, so no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, so from, from the standpoint of, um, you know, why are we doing this? And, and so we're doing it because we've done over 150 films in a really short period of time. Yeah. Uh, we put it, it, this year alone close to ninety million dollars to work in in this industry, um, in the film industry or in the entertainment industry, I should say. Um, and there are a lot of projects that would have never shown up on your television during COVID or in a movie theater near you prior to March, um, and it's pretty 
great to see the jobs that it's created. It's great to see the excitement and the um, underlying content that exists because of our business. And not to mention, we've we've made a uh, we're we're not out here to do it for free. We're, we're making money, um, and we've made great returns for our investors in the company as well. Because you know, I've 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 talked to sales agents who who not only want a credit. But they they want an executive producer credit. They want portions of the IP. They want a percentage of the I, the underlining IP. They want their logo in the front of the it's producers reps that do the same thing. Let alone distribution companies, uh, you know, and, yeah. and and getting credits for them and stuff like that. It's it's refreshing, you sir. Not, it's refreshing. <laughs> you will not, uh, and maybe maybe to our fault, you will not uh, find our name out there because we are not we're not the ones that put in the blood sweat and tears into making it so we are not going to ask for credit we are not going to be executive producers we we are excited in our involvement in the capacity we get involved in at value and that's it there's there's no strings attached I, 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 it's, it's unheard of, uh, what you're, what you're doing, sir. You're, you're actually leading with, with your financial mind and not the ego, which is a, a very, it's just strange to talk to someone like that uh, on, in the business. It's, it's just because I've just, I've just talked to thousands and thousands of people in this industry. <laughs> and generally speaking, I've met a handful, I could probably count on one hand who are just, I'm just about the business. Because we're just about the business. Yeah, I, I, I again, sometimes it doesn't work because I go into a meeting and someone wants to talk to me about, uh, you know, how amazing that actor did on that day of shooting. And I don't know the actor they're talking about. I don't know <laughs> what they're referring to when they're talking about what stage they're in in principle. And I'm just sitting here saying, like, look, I love that you're so passionate and excited about it. But can I go back to, you know, creating my general ledger um, and making sure that we do everything the right way so that we can get you your tax credit back quick. And that's kind of, you don't want the guy who's doing your tax credit to be, uh, you know, on set, you know, I, I don't I want that guy. That. I never understood that. Like, why do you want the accountant there? Why? I, I mean, I guess you don't, but why, should, why do they think they should be there? Like what, want, what right do they have to be you know, as the tax credit lender or the broker or the servicer, why are they on your set? Because everybody and their mother wants to be on set. It is a general statement. I've had it a thousand times. Like, hey, can I come down to set one day while you're shooting? Can I do this or that? It is just the nature of our business because we are arguably one of the sexier businesses out there in the world. Um, and Hollywood has done an amazing job selling that sizzle uh, over over the last hundred plus years. Uh, and that's what people, people, you know, and that's why there's, as we like to call dumb money who, yep. who, who put in money into a movie because they just want to experience that, that experience. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, yep. it's a, look, it's a fascinating business, man. It's, 150 titles plus I personal, I, I have never step foot on a movie set in my entire life <laughs> ever well sir if you and i ever do business together i'm gonna fly you in uh to <laughs> so this is the way we're gonna do it. i'm gonna fly you onto the set and then you're and then i'm gonna i'm gonna use that as a tax credit because i'm gonna fly you and i'm gonna charge i'm gonna pick you up in my van for three hundred thousand yep. dollars because i'm an expensive van service and we're gonna use that money towards a tax credit in georgia there you go <laughs> and we're gonna have to figure this out <laughs> and then i will pick up the phone and they will say Sir, this is the FBI. And I yeah, exactly. Say, have you? Do you know Alex Ferrari? Have you? Have you worked with him? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We exactly. we kid, sir. We're kid. If anyone's listening out there, we're kidding. It's a joke. It's just jokes, yeah. guys. It's just go after Alex, not me. Please. Hey, no, 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 no. I just just <laughs> it's just jokes, sir. It's just jokes. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions to ask all of my guests, but since you are not a filmmaker, I'm going to tailor them a little bit towards you a bit sure. um what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to deal with tax credits in today's world ask dumb questions because no one when when we hire someone at at forest road 
they get this period of time in which they can ask anything they want. We expect them to know nothing. Um, and so because people think like, oh, I know, yeah, tax credit. Yeah, you get it back from the state. Because they do that, they don't feel like they are asking. I am constantly asking the state the dumb questions. And so your dumb questions are not dumb and they can make or break this whole thing. So I know that sounds cliche. If you are a filmmaker, first off, do not make any film without exploring both the local, wherever you are located, your um, tax credit and rebate options. But if you are making content or you are investing in content, the first question you need to be asking yourself is how am I maximizing um, this municipal product that can reduce the amount of money I need to raise? And then the second part is I need to hire the right people or partner with the right people or do the work myself to make sure I fully understand everything that needs to happen to do this the right way. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Well, let's see. I, I, I learned this one recently, having never wanted to actually be an entrepreneur and start a business. I, I loved working for someone else. I loved just being a soldier and, mm -hmm. and uh, marching orders and following them. No matter what you're investing in people until you really understand that you don't, you don't get what investing is. It could be the best idea. It could mm -hmm. be the most sure fire proof investment. It's bulletproof. No matter what you're going to make X, no matter how you cut it, no matter how smart your lawyers are, I've got the best lawyers in the world that have papered this thing, no matter what you're investing in people. And until you, underwrite to that and get it nothing else matters absolutely i mean if you watch shark tank uh you you see it yep. week in and week out it's these guys invest in people exactly they're very smart and i've seen so many investors who go you know we want to invest in this filmmaker um they might not be the most experienced they might know but this but they have a vision and i think they can bring it to the table and let's help them get to where but we're going to invest in this person as opposed to the script only or things like that. Yep. It's all about the, it is all about the people now. Um, and of course, three of your favorite films of all time, sir. Oof, this is time. I haven't watched, I haven't watched many. Um, <laughs> you're, ki you're killing me smalls. You're killing me smalls. Three, and you don't even know that reference three, because you, you haven't seen that movie. <laughs> I tell me what movie that's from. I'll, Sandlot. I'll tell you if I saw it. Sandlot. I have seen Sandlot. It was <laughs> it was a long time ago, but I've seen it. Okay. Um, okay. Three of my favorite movies. Forrest Gump, brilliant. Sure. Um, the 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 music, the story, it's it it's got it all. Sure. Um, I, okay, so I'll I'll categorize it with I like movies that have it all. Uh, it's got romance, action, sports, war. It it covers it does. all the bases. It does really. It really does. Um, second one, I'm going to go with Goodwill Hunting mm -hmm. and I'll categorize that one as acting. Mm -hmm. Just Robin Williams in that movie. It, that's right. art. Like that's just, that's just pure genius. The third one, the third one, I will, I'm trying to go with something like that, that maybe your viewers have not seen go for it. or something off the run. Um, there's a documentary called Into the Arms of Strangers. Okay. It is about the Kinder Transport, which was basically during during the, the Nazi Germany and World War II era, where the United <laughs> Kingdom sent Jewish children on a train for them to have never never see their families again, um, to live in the homes of of uh, UK residents and yes. to basically save the lives of thousands of, of Jewish children. Um, it's a, it's a documentary that is uh, it's, it's incredible. It, it won an Academy award. I, I do not know what year it won. This is years ago, uh, but it's an incredible story. 
it's informative, it is touching. Uh, and, and I just think I, I'm not a big doc person, but I would recommend it highly as, as it, it covers all the bases of, of a great documentary, which is, it, it is super informative and it's a touching, amazing story. And where can people find you and the work you're doing? Uh, our website, it, the Forest Road Co. Um, I would say check out obviously your your podcast and and uh, and and everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, we, we again, you won't find us on the 150 plus films unless you wait till all the way at the end of the the movie where it says. You know, I think some of the filmmakers have put thanks for tax credit finance, you know, whatever uh, in, in their credits. But um, check out, you know, the, the, the films that we've done. I, I, I don't know how you would necessarily search for that. I guess maybe I, IMDb. Uh, yeah, I'll, put, I'll, put links, um, I'll put links to all of that in the, in the show notes. You're a horrible uh, – yeah. prom- by the way, you're a horrible promoter of yourself. I'm horrible. a terrible promoter. I, I would much prefer to promote you than, <laughs> than our business. I, I'm – I'm honestly, uh, uh, most of our businesses were, uh, I should say, 100% of our business is word of mouth. Right. So we do not market, we do not do prep, you know, any of that stuff. It's, it's all ways in which we believe in whoever we've reached out to, um, and they've recommended us to fellow filmmakers and, and everyone else. I feel that uh, the phone and the email might ring a bit after this episode airs. So I need you to prepare yourself um, for we that. Are- we are uh, we are <laughs> flush with cash and <laughs> stop, stop, stop saying things like that, sir. Stop saying things like that. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what's going to happen. I've warned guests before. I've warned guests before. I'm like, listen, don't say stuff like this. Don't put your email out there. <laughs> Cause you're going to get, and I get, I get a call back and like, Alex, I'm so sorry. You're right. I I got like, I got a thousand emails in my box. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do a better job of, uh, of the promotion, but, um, the gist is, is, is we, we're really passionate about what we do. We, mm-hmm. we take our job seriously. We, uh, if you go to our website, the first thing that you will see is redefining lending and, and we do want to redefine how this process works in this industry. And so Forest 1R, not like Forest Gum, forestroadco.com. Check out our website. If you look at film lending, which is the third thing I think in there, you will click on new COVID reopening updates, as well as anything below where you see state rankings. Click on any state on this interactive map, type in your email, we can send you a cheat sheet on how to make your film in that state. We will work in accordance with the film commission with you. We do all of this free of charge. We are just trying to help put the most money on the silver screen uh, and help the filmmaker so that we get that repeat customer. We have never had a one night stand. If we work with you once, we will work with you again. Oh. Um, and, and, and that's the goal. Uh, and it's uh, it's no longer the silver screen, sir. It's the silver monitor. It's really it's, <laughs> it's really the silver iPad. It's 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 a it's a it's a rough state of affairs we're in right now uh, with the silver screen. Um, but exactly. that's another conversation for another podcast. Uh, Zach, man, thank you so much for being so uh, candid and informative and dropping amazing knowledge bombs about tax credits um, for the tribe today. So thank you again, my friend. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of you everything that you're doing the knowledge that 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 you're dropping on 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 your listeners on the readers the book i can tell you not only helped us as a company be a better friend to the filmmaker but i think it also helped our clients and customers make better product uh and ultimately make more money in in what they seek out to do so a lot of appreciation to you for for putting that together and and for putting your work out there Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I want to thank Zach for coming on the show and truly dropping some knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you so, so much, Zach. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode and get more information on how you can get access to tax credits in your state or country, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 447. 
And guys, if you haven't already, please head over to ifhtv.com and check out the over 2,200 videos we have to help you on your filmmaking and or screenwriting journey. It is the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers and screenwriters. That's at ifhtv.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 